By the 1850s, the idea that an atom is an indivisible entity was widely accepted and yet there were many unexplained results. Many scientists, particularly Michael Faraday, were experimenting with what are now known as discharge tubes. Take a look at this. A typical discharge tube is made of a transparent glass which envelops and seals two electrodes. These metal plates, as in these electrodes, are connected to a high voltage electrical source. Now, that might sound strange that we knew how to work with electricity much, much before we even came across electrons. In class 12, you will study that an electric current involves the flow of electrons in most cases. But such is life. We mastered electricity long before we even knew what electrons are. I'm digressing here. Let's get back to the discharge tube, shall we? As you can see, this sealed glass container is connected to a vacuum pump which helps evacuate the air from inside of the discharge tube. In other words, we could control the pressure of the gas enclosed within this structure. Many scientists experimented with similar setups but observed a strange phenomenon. When the pressure of the gas was kept very low and the voltage kept very high, there seemed to be a stream of particles that flew from the negative plate, as in the cathode, all the way to the, through the anode rather. These were called cathode rays or cathode ray particles. In most cases, these rays couldn't be seen directly. But when the anode, the metal plate, connected to the positive terminal is made porous, these rays could pass through the anode. A screen coated with a suitable material like zinc sulfide is kept behind the anode. And when the cathode rays strike the screen, there is scintillation, as in there is a glow. This experiment captured the imagination of many scientists and kept them wondering for decades. For science in general, and physics in particular, the late 1800s seemed to be a fascinating point in time. The scientific community was confident that we knew everything there is to know, that physics could explain most everyday phenomena to a great extent. Scientists were convinced that nothing new or revolutionary could happen. Only improvements could be made in terms of the accuracy of measurements. Times were good, the industrial revolution was taking shape, and the scientific community exuded confidence with a rare sense of clarity. Suddenly, out of nowhere, an English physicist, Joseph John Thomson, made a phenomenal discovery. In the year 1906, Sir J.J. Thomson went on to win a well-deserved Nobel Prize in physics for this discovery. In the 1890s, he was experimenting with cathode rays. So let us bring back the experimental setup. As you can see, he used hydrogen gas and the cathode rays originated from the cathode and they passed through the small opening in the anode. In the late 19th century, electromagnetism was a very well-established discipline of physics. And we knew pretty much everything about it, as in how charges behaved under electric and as well as magnetic fields. Thomson investigated the behavior of these cathode rays under electric and magnetic fields. For instance, when he introduced a deflection plate, Thomson observed a deflection indicating that the cathode rays were in fact negatively charged particles. Although he named these particles corpuscles, Eventually, they were called electrons. He figured out a mathematical relationship between the degree of deflection and the charge to mass ratio of the rays. Do note, however, that Thomson could not arrive at either the mass or the individual charge, but he deduced the charge to mass ratio of electrons. Further, when he used a very high voltage between the deflection plates, he found evidence Pointing to, the ex pointing to the existence of a positive particle. As in, he found bright spots on the other direction, except that, in this case, the degree of deflection was much smaller than before. Given the atom is electrically neutral, both the charges should be equal and opposite, don't you think? He observed that since the negative particles deflected to a far greater extent, the mass of the negative particle should be much smaller comparatively. Thus, Thomson mathematically proved that the negative particles don't weigh much 
and most of the mass of the hydrogen atom comes from the hydrogen ion. He showed that the nature of the negative particles is independent of both the electrode material as well as the gas used inside of the discharge tube. Based on his experimental results, Sir J.J. Thomson proposed a new theory of how an atom looked like, the plum pudding model. He theorized that an atom looks like the English dessert, plum pudding. Majority of the pudding, the whole body, accounts for the positive charge and mass of the atom, whereas the negative charge is scattered randomly throughout the pudding. In case, just in case, an old English dessert is difficult to relate to or imagine. Think of the atom as a watermelon. The electrons are equivalent to the seeds which are distributed randomly throughout the pulp of the fruit. The juicy flesh is where most of the mass and the charge come from. Although the seeds, as in the electrons, have an equal and opposite charge, we can disregard their mass. What are the important takeaways from this video? To start with, Sir J.J. Thompson had a sweet tooth. Of all the fanciful things in the world, why pick a funny looking English dessert? Jokes apart, his discovery of electrons as a fundamental subatomic particle gave us a completely revolutionized physics. Atoms were no longer indivisible and this would lead to the legendary Rutherford's gold foil experiment. Granted, electron is a fundamental subatomic particle. Great deal, big deal. But did you know that Sir J.J. Thompson was an extraordinary mentor? As many as seven people who worked under him went on to win Nobel Prizes. In fact, his son, George Pager Thompson, was one of them. And as fate would have it, the son won the Nobel Prize for proving that the electron is not a particle, thus disproving his father. Do you know what is even stranger? Both of them, the father and son, are correct at the same time. For more videos and live lectures on the JEE, click on the subscribe button now.